my name is uh, Jason J. Rock Houston, and you guys are listening to Chaotic Chris Magazine. Our special guest tonight is um, lead singer Sean Peck, and uh, many people know him from um, Cage and um, Death Dealer, but tonight we're going to be talking with him about his other band, Dinner and Sherman, and their great debut album, uh, Mas uh, Masters of Evil. How are you doing tonight, Sean? Hello, can you hear me? How you doing? <laughs> yeah. Doing great, man. Love talking about metal. Yeah, yeah. And um, like I said at the top of the interview, um, many people know you from the band Cage. That's been your primary um, project for years. But now you got Dinner and Sherman and, um, of course, Death Dealer. Um, how much do you enjoy having these two other bands kind of, you know, like, um, you know, just e extra projects, kind of do something different outside of your every, you know, day life? And let me ask you, um, how uh, were you at all a, a fan of that of Merciful Fate um, growing up? Oh yeah, I mean, super, super huge. I was kind of a late bloomer to that. I mean, I didn't find out about King Diamond and Merciful Fate until like the Abigail album, like right yeah, yeah. before the Abigail album came out. Like literally, this guy turned me on. He's like, check this album out, Fatal Fortress, from this guy King Diamond. And I was like, oh, this is killer. And then like right then the Abigail album hit, and I went and saw King Diamond in the deepest, darkest pit of L.A. Uh, on that tour. And it was, to, to, to this day, it's still one of probably the top three concerts I ever went to. Wow, and wow. And, like, right, you know, and we went, we got there at, like, noon and waited in the parking lot. King Diamond, you know, pulled up, and we ran up and got, you know, on, had him autographed by Al. I still have him. He wrote Come to the Sabbath on my, uh, on my, my vinyl and, um, so it was just an insane experience, and I was indoctrinated, you know, since since the, since that point, and then went back and discovered this whole merciful fate thing, and just what a, what a shroud of mystery, and, and like um, it's real. Um, man, what's the word? It's just like it's an ominous, um, foreboding vibe. Just the pictures of the you know the album covers and the photos and and the songs, and they're you know just so unique, and so. Yeah, I mean, I'm such a huge fan, and of course we wrote the song King Diamond, you know, from Cage, and, and I just came off of doing a, a full-on, you know, horror concept album with Cage, so yeah, yeah. super heavily influenced uh, by King Diamond and Merciful Fate. Now let me ask you, Sean, um, do you know how these guys, uh, you know, how you came on their radar? I mean, um, were, were um, they already aware of who you were? Did somebody recommend you to them when they started putting this Dinner Sherman project together? No, I mean, I, I, I read it on, you know, a, a metal website, like, Hank Sherman and Michael Denner are going to do a record, you know, you know the, I think the news article said they were going to use a bunch of different singers, and so I just literally went on Facebook and, you know, looked up Hank Sherman and <laughs> sent him a private message and said, my name's Sean, I sing in a band called Cage, I'm a huge fan, I would love to, you know, if you need singers, I would love to try and sing on a track and, you know, check out some of my work. And he got right back to me and said, oh, yeah, I know who you are. Yeah, that would be cool. Um, when we get, you know, I'll hit you up when we get a little closer to making it a reality. And, and I was saying, I tell the story, like, I was just so fanboyed out. Yeah, I bet. Even, like, sent me back to message. I was telling everybody, like, oh, my God, did Hank Sherman freaking talk to me today? And I was, like, freaking out just to even have him respond. And then... Um, a few months later, I got a message going, hey, are you still interested in doing a song? And I was just like, oh, my God. I'm like, absolutely, totally interested. And, um, you know, then he sent me uh, a piece of music 
which ended up being Warwich off the Satan's to me P, which yeah. was a real painkiller kind of thing. And of course yeah, I heard yeah. that and I'm like, Oh yeah, I can, you know, tear into this and he goes, Oh well check this one out and he sent me another one which ended up being the title track Satan's Tomb. And uh, I immediately went into my little home studio and recorded a, a chorus. You know, I wrote the lyrics out and, and recorded a chorus to what would be the title track of the EP, Satan's Tomb, and I, I sent it off to him, and I was just on pins and needles, just got, oh, my God, I hope he likes it. Oh, please, please. You know, just so nervous. And then he, and then he wrote me back. He's like, hey, this sounds cool. Do you want to just do the whole EP? And I was like, uh, yeah, I want to do that. <laughs> so, so let me ask you when, you, when you guys went in to do the Satan Tomb EP, um, were, were you, was it for sure that you were going to be the, you know, permanent singer in the band, or at that point they are just like, okay, we're going to put out the EP and see what kind of response we get, and then kind of after that, um, they asked you to, you know, become a permanent member? Well, um, I found that later that, you know, Michael, um, you know, Hank was talking to Michael, and Hank's like, hey, what about this singer guy, and then Michael went to his son, actually, and said, hey, this guy sings in cage, what do you think about this, and Michael's son, you know, said, oh my God, dude, he's awesome. He's got a song called King Diamond. Wow. And he played Michael the song King Diamond and he absolutely loved it. And he's like, I love this guy. So that was part of the backstory of how I, you know, got it. And then, and then Hank and I started writing those first four songs together and um, we really kind of clicked, which is, you know, you never know how it's going to go. Um, you know, writing with someone who's, you know, that... If, that bus legendary stature situation. And we ended up, you know, really putting together, you know, four really solid songs, like right off the bat. And, you know, we, and we ended up kind of figuring out that we, you know, actually were, were a good writing team. He, his favorite band is Judas Priest, and so is mine. So wow, wow. How cool is that? That, that definitely helps. Now, now, of course, you listen to both these Denner and Sherman um, CDs, and, you know, one thing that um, really... Uh, comes right off the bat to me is uh, like you said definitely hear Judas Priest um, influence in there and I, I would say like it, it reminds me of old school like European power metal um, like early Iron Maiden even and um, being that these guys are originally you know from um, you know no Europe how, how big of um, you know influence was that European sound um, to what you guys are doing well I mean um, I mean I've now you know all the records I've done I'm sure I've settled into my own kind of writing style and, and tendencies but uh, we go back to your, your previous question like I think once we you know um, wrote those four songs I think that's when they you know they were happy with them they decided okay yeah, we can move forward with with Sean as you know as the permanent guy and then we actually performed together at the Titans of Rock you know it's kind of an all-star thing and Tel Aviv was the first time wow wow we, we met each other and, and performed together, and we did um, two Merciful Fate songs, and then we did Paranoid of all of wow, all wow. And then, but the vibe was really good. You know, I hung out with you know those guys till like five in the morning, and we really bonded. And I think that that helped um, you know solidify our, our relationship going forward. But um, the European you know sound, I mean, um, I would say the new wave of British heavy metal, you know, like, you know Iron Maiden, Judas Priest type stuff for sure is a heavy influence on me. Yeah. The European power metal, um, probably not as much besides like mm -hmm. the first uh, lead records, but um, you know, to, to Hank and Michael love the 70s priest. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. That was more of an 80s priest um, guy. Uh, we've so far managed to really put all of our influences together and make it rip. And, and, yeah, and I, I think what's cool about um, you know this particular uh, CD, Masters of Evil, is Sean is um, you know in, in all three bands we mentioned, um, you know you could have come in and you know made another record sound just like a Cage record, but you know this is a different band, and and you put the Sean Peck stamp on it so to speak with the vocals, but you know it does sound like a, a new band. It does sound like a new band where every guy has brought his influence into, and I, I think that's what makes it just a so much of a powerful record, you know. Well, the way Hank writes. Um, tempo changes and guitar riffs and, and change, you know we, we could release probably six or seven different versions of each song yeah, I mean, yeah. the, the things are constantly changing and um, you know the, the his writing style is, is, is with Michael is what makes them you know the freaking guitar gods that they are because they're 
So, you know, they're both kind of geniuses when it comes to that whole arrangement idea. So I had to learn a lot. I mean, you know, Cage and Death Dealer, you know, is, is sometimes formulaic, um, you know, in a good way. And that's just kind of how I structure things. But, you know, a song like um, The Baroness, you know, where um, not one part is duplicated in the whole song. It's like, what, almost eight minutes long. And, um <laughs> There was a part in there, like, you know, I came up with a really merciful fate kind of melody, and I'm like, oh, dude, we gotta, you know, we gotta, this part's gotta come back, man, we gotta have this part again, and, and Hank was like, no, 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 you know, none of these parts are gonna return, I'm like, all right, so, I, I, I really, uh, I grew as a songwriter by working with those guys, and that's why it doesn't sound like a cage or a death dealer record. Oh, yeah, and that, nothing against that, but I, I, I just think this sounds what it was like, what it was meant to sound like, you know, something you know, entirely different, and where each guy kind of gets to bring his own, you know, influence into in, in, into the band, which is, is a great thing now. These guys, like you said, they're superstar, you know, guitar players, and, um, you know, but how do they go about, you know, splitting up the guitar parts? I mean, uh, to me, it almost sounds like you guys got a KK, um, Glenn Tipton type thing going here. Um, I mean, these, these guys are just super, like, they could both be lead players. I mean, how do they go about splitting the guitar parts? Just um, each guy kind of does his own parts, or, but he writes? Yeah, I mean, you know, we kind of, you know, Tank um, comes up with the the basis of most of the of the you know, rhythm parts, and then you know, Michael takes an overview of it. You know, they've got their system together. They're like, you know, yin and yang, and then Michael will come in and just like lay down some melodies that are just like magic over the top of it, and like, oh yeah. So it's those guys, you know, have. You know, they were they were born to play guitar together, so that's kind of how that works. And um, you know, I uh, I I wrote all the the vocal melodies and all the lyrics, and um, and we we just made it work. And you know, Hank's got his lead style, and Michael's got his lead style. That's real distinctive. You can tell, you know, who's playing what. And um, so far, you know, we've written twelve songs together, and they have all been pretty damn good. So we're excited. Yeah, and, and I got to ask, as far as the recording goes, um, were you guys all in the same room together? Or like you said, you guys are kind of spread out throughout the you know world. So, did you kind of like send them your vocals as you would get them done, and they kind of piece everything together? Were you guys ever actually in the same um, recording studio together? No, it was all done separately. I mean, I recorded all the vocals in mm -hmm. San Diego, and you know, Hank tracked his guitars in Denmark with Michael, and then you know, Snowy Shaw did his drums in Sweden. Mark um, Grabowski did his bass playing in Denver, and then it was mixed in, in I think Stock, I uh, think Gottenberg it was mixed. <clears throat> so, um, you know, it's. And that is the modern way of doing things, but, 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 but let me ask you, Sean, what, I mean, it must have been different also in the sense that, um, you know, I'd imagine you, you, know, you guys were kind of um, creating this record, and then probably, you know, you guys are meeting each other for a first time after. Um, you know, everything's finally mixed and the record comes out. What was that like? You know, like, hey guys, nice to finally meet you. We look, look at what we created. Yeah, that was, well, like I said, the, after we recorded the EP and, and uh, the EP was released, we, the first time I met Mike, Michael and Hank was in Tel Aviv. So we did this Titans of Rock with, you know, Chuck Billy, uh, wow. you know, Ralph Sheepers of Primal Fear, Ripper, uh, Uli John Roth, I mean, there was all kinds of things, it was a really killer lineup, and I got asked, you know, it was my first, you know, all-star kind of thing that I ever got to do, where I was, you know, so like, I actually, and I sang five songs, so I sang two songs with uh, Ross the Boss, so I had more songs than anybody in the wow. line, which was really killer, and um, so, but they, their, their flight got delayed, wow. so they literally showed up to the venue like, two hours before we were scheduled to hit the stage. So we had no practice. Mm. We went to a little room and kind of did an acoustic like run through with it with the drummer kind of playing on the table with two sticks. Mm. And we're like, all right, well, let's hope for the best. So, and then we, you know, it's like, okay, you guys are up next. And I thought there was one more song, so it was even more frantic. Like, <laughs> oh, I thought they had one more song. No, 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 you're on right now. And so we got up there and um, it was right after the, the um, girl from Nightwish, not Tarja, but the, mm -hmm. the other chick from Nightwish sang, you know, some some fa la la you know, wow, wow. song and then and then I came out there and I'm like, It's about ready to get fucking dark in here and the place just exploded with laughs. Yeah. And then uh, there's 
funny because Hank goes, and then Hank and Michael were on the same side together. So it's like both guitar players like standing wow. right next to each other, which was kind of weird. And Hank's like, give me a second, you know, to uh, get my guitar tone. And, and I'm like, yeah, cool, man, you know, whatever. And then like right when he said that, the announcer was like, and here they are. You know, I'm like, gosh, you're so safe. And, like, <laughs> it was just like start right there. So no one got any time to like tune their stuff in. And it was just, I'm sure for them it was, um, it was kind of a, a blur, but for me it was great, man. I got to freaking do all the King Diamond impersonation stuff, and the place just went nuts. If you can look up Titans of Rock. Okay, uh, yeah, I'll do that, definitely. On, uh, on YouTube, and there's a couple of videos, and you can see how the place has just gone nuts. And now let, let me ask you, being a relatively new but band. Let, but let me just finish yeah. that. Yeah. But that, you know, they, they go into this dressing room, and there's like 50 people, like all the stars. It was like, <laughs> the dressing room scene, it was one big room, it was incredible, just all the metal dignitaries. Wow, wow, band. wow. And I go, I go, hey man, nice to meet you, we're in a band together, are you, you know, so you ready to perform? So it was, it was total trial by fire, man, it was just, we were just laughing at how it was just a quick slam together, so yeah, it was cool to see those guys. Wow, so um, as far as playing live, have you guys played, you know, um, much here in the U.S.? Do you guys, uh, like, like, what's your touring plan? Do you plan to, like, do, like, major tours or just, like, the big festivals? No, no, we're, we're planning on, a, you know, touring all the territories. So there, there's agents that are putting stuff together right now. Um, we've done three, besides the Tel Aviv thing, we've done three shows. We did the, a couple festivals and then, like, uh, a show where we literally played, you know, nothing but eight Merciful Fate songs, wow, wow. four songs of the EP. Wow. So, um, but we, the, the original stuff is going over fantastic. It was, you know, I knew the songs were good, but there's, you know, when you play a song live, mm -hmm. you can just feel um, how the crowd reacts, and then the crowd is just going bonkers for the new songs. And then, you know, you throw in the Merciful Fate songs, and, you know, it's, it's, so much fun to play with those guys. And what was it, what was it like for you to perform those, um, you know, Merciful Fate, um, you know, songs? Um, the actual, you know, we've, we've tuned everything to, um, to one tuning, um, cause, you know, for, e for travel mm -hmm. purposes to make it easier. Um, not because, you know, I need to change or anything, but, you know, to simplify the guitar stuff, and so the, the Merciful Fate songs are actually tuned down. Well, it's actually harder for me to sing them tuned down. Yeah, yeah. It's higher, like it's easier for me to sing them up higher, which seems kind of weird. But, um, you know, there, I got a, I got a pretty damn good, you know, King Diamond impersonation, so it's really fun to bust that out. <laughs> you know, that, <laughs> I love that, I love that. <laughs> There's a couple, you know, there's, I think there's a video of us doing Black Funeral at um, the Magic Metal Festival, and that there's, I get some, like, crazy notes on that. Because <laughs> when they're tuned in, i got to go, like, way high above the mm. note to throw the falsetto up on there. So it's, um, there's some super freaking, you know, glass-shattering uh, wailing that I get to do. But I love that shit. Yeah. And you guys are on uh, Metal Blade Records. How, how cool is that? I mean, um, everything about this release is, you know, metal. I mean, right down to the artwork. I'm looking at the album cover. As we speak, you know, cool looking skull like with a claw type um, thing, you know, like hand grabbing it. It looks, uh, and I think it's perfect title, Masters of Evil. Everything about the album, the, you know, the look, the sound, everything. You guys are totally metal. It's totally, you know, evil. I, I just love the whole album. I mean, um, I got I got to ask you right off the bat. You know, eight songs. Um, why you know why eight songs? Why not ten? Is it just that? Um, you know, this is what you guys had, and like, hey, let's 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 just go and record a full length, and because um, again, you can't go bad with eight songs. Because I mean, look at um, go, going back to you know Black Sabbath, nineteen eighty. Look what they did with Heaven and Hell. I mean, that's kind of the comparison I make. Yeah, I mean, I'm you know my other records, um, I've always been criticized that we I'm usually cramming. You know, <laughs> the the Black Cage album was like seventy eight minutes long. Yeah. And it's like, <laughs> Down to the minute, yeah, um, down to the minute. <laughs> and then um, we kind of ran, to get it released when we wanted to, we yeah. ran out of time a little bit. I mean, we were, we would have done more songs. We had a lot more material that's left over that we'll do on the next record. Yeah. But it was just pretty much, a, you know, Hank was, was definitely a proponent of a less is more. Um, and so because, because 
we got a little bit under the gun for time. Mm -hmm. You know, there wasn't another song, but um, I wanted to do like a three song concept. <laughs> uh, the Baroness, like an angel's blood, and I was going to do one other. We're going to be kind of a concept story, but um, we ran out of time, so that, that's why there's eight songs. But uh, that Masters of Evil title, man, I always, you know, wanted to use that title, and I'm like, I, go, I told them, I got, you know, because they're trying to decide mm -hmm. their titles. And, you know, they're going, eh, Masters of Evil, it's pretty cool, but, you know, is it the right one? And I said, there's nobody else in metal that could put out an album called Masters of Evil and, like, not, you know, and, and have the credibility to have no one even bat an eye. It's you two guys. Like, yeah. you two guys can put out an album called Masters of Evil and nobody else could, could legitimately stake a claim to that. So we went with it and, um, you know, me being such a big King Diamond Merciful Fate, yeah. you know, fan, coming into this band, you know, I, I'm taking the writing standpoint of what do the fans want to see, what do they want to hear, and that's why all the, the song titles and topics are still down that, you know, dark occult uh, realm, because, I mean, who's going to want to pick up a Dennis Sherman album, and it's like, this song's about love and my girlfriend. Like, yeah, yeah, I, 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 I totally yeah. agree. I mean, Sean, the one, the, that, that's kind of the first thing I know, um, I noticed when I put the, you know, I finished listening to the CD for the first time is, you know, this this is pure full blown on metal. It's, it's pure evil, and that's why when I looked at the title "Masters Evil," I, I totally agree with you. You know, um, there's no love songs on this. There's there's not even anything um, remotely close to you know a power ballad or anything. So um, I, I do think it's a perfect title. And I'll tell you, my top three songs um, off of this album, I'd have to say, are "Angels of Blood," um, "Son of Satan," and um, in the title track, Masters Evil, I love them all, and and I got to compliment you on, on the album for the fact that um, you know, I'd say those are my top three songs. But the the great thing, even though this is like I said, okay, it got eight songs, but um, you guys got it down almost to the minute, and, and there are eight great songs. And what I love about the album is the progression. You know, I I put it on from start to finish, just when I think oh, I just got done listening to my favorite song. The progression is so great because each song gets better and better. Yeah, thanks a lot. Um, you know, going to some of the, you know, the lyric, you know, aspects of it, um, you were, you know, like the call and we're telling scary stories and stuff. But there's, I got like a couple, you know, comments like, oh, the lyrics are so, you know, corny and cheesy. And I'm just like, what do you want, man? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's better sure, but it's got to have this stuff in it. So, um, and, you know, me just coming off a, a completely, you know, huge horror concept album, like I said, with the Cage, Ancient Evil, where I wrote an actual book, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That album, well, yeah, there's a 160-page book that I wrote, you know, telling the story, but, um, and it's funny, going back, I don't know, not many people notice, but on the EP, there's a song called Seven Skulls, and <clears throat> Seven Skulls was actually um, a song I was kind of writing for your death dealer way back in the day. Wow. And then I, I never got around to it. And as I was coming up with that song, you know, idea when I was writing the song just on a piece of paper, I came up with this, this story in my head kept developing. And I dropped what I was doing and wrote like, I think it's like a 120 page, mm -hmm. um, you know, kind of a short story that I wrote for Seven Skulls. Which wow. Kind of is depicted in the song itself. And I haven't published that one yet, but that, I mean, I wrote that whole thing in like four days and just went narc and went crazy and just like finished this. It's a, it's a really cool story and um, that, you know, ended up being a, a Dennis Sherman song. So uh, I'm going to keep uh, doing stuff like that for the next album, you know, because like I said, coming from a fan standpoint, I just thought about flipping the album cover over and looking at the song titles and like, People reading these song titles, you know, Servants of Dagon, The Baroness, you know, Angel's Blood, you know, The Wolf Feeds at Night. I'm like, yeah, this is the stuff as a fan, you know, that I want, that I would want to see, and that's how we approach the final writing. Yeah, I mean, I mean, just you know, looking at the back cover of an um, album here as we as we're speaking, I mean, you know, just looking at the song titles, I mean, that's what grabbed me. And then when I sit here and listen to each individual song, I thought, you know, as far as the lyrics, I thought, man, what, what's some Powerful lyrics, powerful storytelling here. I mean, you take just take the title um, "Pentagram and the Cross." Man, I mean, I'm like, where did this guy come up with this? But it, it is it's just so evil and metal sounding. Uh, you know, you gotta just love it. Yeah, that's. I mean, I, I, I dig that song "Pentagram and the 
that. I was like a straight ahead rocker. But and then you know, then we came up with the Son of Satan, you know, music video, which mm -hmm. looked killer with that crazy cathedral and the gargoyles and the the, the pregnant chick and the dudes with the cloaked hoods and stuff. I mean, so far everything's going going real well. We're working on a couple more music videos right now, and then we're going to be doing some touring, and then um, you know we'll actually start working on the next record. But this once this band gets out, you know, playing live and you know really puts it all together, I think it's going to be, you know, we've already had some, some really killer live magic, but uh, a few more shows under our belt, and I think we're going to be just at a serious, serious force to reckon with. And like, um, like you're mentioning some of the music videos, I love um, the Son of Satan video, talk a little bit about that, I mean, um, how, you know, you're obviously involved with the songwriting, the lyrics, so how involved were you with um, the actual video itself and, you know, the, um, what the video became? filmed with that director with the Death Dealer video and so we ended up using him again and we flew out to, you know, the northern part of Sweden. There's freaking like icebergs on the ground. Wow. And it was where they it was where they filmed that Kung Fury movie too. They did some of that there, which was really cool. It was giant, you know, green screen room. And um, you know, there there was he, we ran a short on time on that too because there were some other edits that we wanted him to do but um, you know it came out cool he kind of followed you know the basics of the of the, of the story as the lyrics were told in there um, and I had a I had a, a I mean I wrote my own um, I had a killer idea for a video for Masters of Evil <laughs> which I still want to do I did, I did a real a killer video treatment but this ended up great you know and like I said the I dug the the whole CG stuff that he did, and um, uh, I think Hank is actually going to do, he's doing a re recut of that <laughs> um, video that's going to be in black and white and stuff, so there's there's like another version coming out, Hank's a pretty amazing video editor himself, so uh, it was cool, man, it's a good, a good uh, you know, people freaked out on the video, they really loved it, so um, we look forward, like I said, we got a couple other videos coming out, and And of course, like we said, obviously um, having the two guys from Merciful Fate, you, you guys kind of, you know, and uh, with, with you in the band as well, Sean, um, kind of got a built-in fan base. I mean, a lot of the cage people are going to probably be checking this this out. Anybody who's into Death Dealer, definitely. But um, have you guys noticed yet? Like, is have you, has there been a better response, say, in the European markets, or um, is everybody been checking this out? Like, you know, all around the world, would you say? Well, yeah, everywhere I go, man, I get. You know, people are talking about it. It's, um, like I was just at the Testament, you know, CD listening party wow. in L.A. and you know, Chuck Billy and um, uh, uh, what's his name, the Atomic Clock, Gene Hoagland. You okay, know, okay, yeah, about yeah. It. And, and you know, then we played Cage played the the Motorhead, you know, like tribute show at uh, with Metal Allegiance guy. Wow, wow, wow. With the whiskey and. You know, backstage was was Dave Grohl and all these people, and they're like, "Oh, you're singing with that new Jenner Sherman stuff." So, uh, and then you know, we just did an East Coast tour with Cage, and like all kinds of people were bringing up the Jenner Sherman vinyls to sign. So, it seems like it's um, you know all over the place. Well, I, I'm glad to hear that because it, it's really to me it's a great sound in CD, and I think um, I think the more people hear it, but you know, everyone's just totally going to love it. But and and. Um, you know, you guys are obviously still, um, you know, going to be touring behind this. But um, have you already started thinking about the next um, CD, or um, is that a few yeah. years down the line? Yeah, we have a lot of material left over. Um, Hank has like a billion riffs that he's already recorded, and um, I've already started, you know, compiling ideas. I have a couple of you know, uh, album title ideas that I <laughs> like. I don't know if I'm going to get my way on this <laughs> one or not, but. Um, and, you know, I will probably start, you know, writing. If we'll probably wait till next year to start writing and, and recording it. So I don't know if it'll come out, you know, late next year yeah. or early 2018, but it's it's definitely... In the works. Um, in the works. And, and next next year for sure, you know, it's going to be another Cage record and there's going to be another Death Dealer record. So oh, I'm wow. deep in the middle of... I'm almost done with the next Cage record and 
we just started writing the next Death Dealer record. So you, you um, ever you ever get any downtime, man? But uh, I, I got to ask you. Um, you know, I think it's great that you have all three projects now. Um, you know, Death Dealer. Um, that, that that's a that's a project you've had going for a few years now, and you, you guys are all um, ready on. Is it your third album? Right. Yeah. yeah. That's pretty. That's pretty exciting. So, um, you know, Death Dealer. Um, what's exciting about that is you guys have already put out so many, so, so much great material, and I think that band's really, um, you know, starting to um, get a lot of notice for what you guys are doing. Yeah, those those two albums were, you know, were fantastic, and um, you know, Cage is that'll be cool. We've got some good fun touring. That's mm -hmm. another fun group of guys, man. It's really it's a great time getting that crew together. I mean, well, just that's a great not only in the music but just, everyone's just nothing but laughs the whole mm -hmm. time through and same thing with Cage man it's all just like I got the best lineup going right now where there's no drama queen yeah, yeah, yeah. got any freaking problems like right now I'm, I'm in bands where there's just you know it's all freaking good and, and Dennis Sherman too like you know those guys ended up being like the coolest you know you don't know who you're gonna get and what they're their uh, personalities are like but you know Hank and Michael it's just it, we're just cracking jokes all the time and it's just like everything's always all good and and so yeah I'm in a real good spot man and then um, I was just with the bass player from Warrior and he's like oh, dude we need to do a Warrior record <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, shit yeah if I can and, find some so, um, it's just fun making metal like I said last I feel like I didn't uh, do enough I only put one album out since um or no, I haven't, let's see, since last October, um, you know, when it was Pectober. Yeah, I like that, yeah, Pectober, out. yeah. That's, that's pretty Three cool. albums out in, in one month, and then, you know, I was at one album now since then. I feel like I'm flagging. I feel like I'm slacking, man. Yeah, and as far as um, Dinner Sherman, it's, it's actually got, you know, the band's obviously named after the two guitar players, but um, um, is that, do they really treat it as a band where, you know, like, um, do they kind of tell you, Sean, when we go and record, these are the songs you're going to do, or um, does everybody kind of get a say, or, you know? Uh, well, I mean, that's, you know, you, you enter, just like when I started writing with Ross the Boss, I'm like, how am I going to tell Ross the Boss? Like, what to I do? I disagree with this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think my idea is better than your idea. Um, but I was just surprised, you know, working with Hank um, and Michael, just like, we pretty much agreed on everything, and I, I, it must be because we we come from the priest background. So yeah, um, we didn't have any like you know there wasn't any major like oh god I wish we would have just left that like it was. There's everything that was uh, that ended up being the final versions were you know I'm like yeah man that's that I agree with that that's badass. So and I always trust my own metal barometer, man. I mean I don't you know I don't look for anybody else's you know, approval, like, what do you think? Cause yeah, yeah. If I, I, I've, I've, you know, my metal barometer has, has always served me well, like, no, this is badass, you know, to, if you get the goosebumps and the hair stands on your arm, you're like, okay, yeah, it's, that's the metal, so. And, and, uh, but we, yeah. but um, I've, no conflicts, and um, yeah. they're, they're always going to get, the, they're going to have their say, I'm not, I'm not going to be able to trub anything from those guys, but I, hasn't come to that so that's been great oh that, that's great and, and I love the fact that you, you told me like um, when you first got together with them that you, that you got an opportunity to perform some of that um, King Diamond and Merciful Fate material because the um, thing comes to mind is uh, you're probably the only um, other guy other than King Diamond that's ever gone up on a big stage and, and performed those songs and uh, and I think that just says something about you know what a talented singer you are to be able to have the ability to sing you know those um, those powerful um, Merciful yeah, Fate tunes um, all kinds of you know King Diamond tribute singers. I got a friend who just put out an album called Them. Um, oh, okay, okay. Which is yeah. he's in a King Diamond tribute band, but now he's done an original uh, album that sounds a lot like King Diamond. So yeah, he can do it, you know, in his, with his eyes closed. But I um, mean, I got a lot. You know, I do the you know the Halford thing and the, the King Diamond thing. So I'm, I'm utilizing like a lot of different vocal techniques. Which yeah, I'm not a lot of people. I guess do it like like I do it, but um, it's not easy, man. I it's bet not. not. Kid, kids at kids at home, you know, control yeah. your position for trying this. Yeah, I mean, I, I I think that's why very few people have tried it. You know, it, it takes a certain um, vocal ability. The very last thing I want to ask you, Sean. Last time I talked, I think um, Cage had played. Um, I, I believe it was the Monsters of Rock Cruise, and uh, I, I think Motorhead played with you, and I think that was one of the very last. That was Death Dealer played the motorboat. 
Oh, okay. Oh, that death dealer. Okay. And, and I think that's one one of the very last things um, Lemmy ever did for he got seriously ill. What was that like? Um, you know, that death cruise was like one of the funnest things ever. Um, I met him. I saw him in the casino um, playing a slot machine. And I was able to, you know, say hi to him. And um, so I did get to see him and, you know, say hi to him and then see him perform on the cruise. And then two months later, you know, we're playing the memorial concert sold out at the Whiskey in, wow. you know, in Hollywood, you know, right by the Rainbow, right right where he lived with all the, you know, the, you should have seen the backstage, I mean, who was back there. So, yeah, yeah. And we played, you know, right before the Medal of Allegiance. And so we were kind of part of, a little part of heavy metal history, which, you know, is honored to be. I gave a, I gave this really cool speech, um, kind of, you know, on stage, it went over really good, and um, said, you know, that, you know, metals unites us right now, and he's up in heaven, you know, looking down on all of us, you know, raising his fucking glass. And blah, yeah. Blah, but, um, yeah, it was a, it was a, it was definitely a vibe in the room that night, and you know, just coming off the motorboat cruise, it's just weird how some things work out. You know, we have, and then we were already scheduled to do those shows with Metal Legions, and then it just randomly ended up being, you know, turning into the the tribute show for him. I mean, one of the new local newspapers in Los Angeles said, "Yeah, before Metal Legions played, Rob Halford got up and sang with some band." <laughs> I gotta love that. <laughs> <laughs> No. <laughs> if, if you, because uh, you you do sound a lot like um, you know Halford, and obviously that's you know your influence coming out. Have you ever met the metal god himself? Yeah, I met him at the dam. Um, I met. I think that's the only time I actually met him. I and mean, we played with Halford. We opened for him in San Diego. Oh, and wow, wow! He literally pulled up in a car, got on stage. And I was in the back, you know, with Roy, I'm friends with Roy Z, and you know, Mike Davis is his bass player, and my band Death Dealer. And, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, you know, Joe Zombing and all that. And I was, like, backstage, like, waiting to ambush him for an autograph. He literally, thank you, good night, and, like, out the door in a car, gone. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. You know? <laughs> um, well. He's like, Roy Z, he's like, he's gone, bro. He's gone already. I'm like, what the? There's no way you could escape. I'm like, yeah, he went out that door. I'm like, come on. Elvis has uh, left the building. <laughs> yeah, I want to not. Yeah. I've emailed him a few times, you know, and conversed with him via email and like, hey, uh, you know, he's got, he's left me tickets for some pre-shows and, oh, cool. you know, I guess he knows, you know, we know some of the same people, but, um, and then used his, you know, publicist to do some business and, um, yeah, he's, I think he's, you know, he'll never, he'll, he's the greatest metal singer ever and no one will ever, will ever top Halford. Yeah, no, no I, I must agree with you there. And, and um, very last thing I want to ask, Sean, before I let you go, is um, you have all these these three great bands now. Um, I imagine as a singer you're writing all the time, so does it kind of just depend on um, you know, what you're recording for? Like um, when you write a song, for example, do you write in a way to know if, if it's going to be a Cage song or a Death Dealer song or a Dinner and Sherman song? I'm still kind of you know learning how that's all, you know, because it's still... I don't know if it's new, but I mean, the Cage stuff was easy because we were doing a concept record, so yeah. any, like, lyrical concepts, you know, stuff with the story, then anything that wasn't that, I was putting into the Death Dealer record, and now I'm in a place with the Death Dealer and Cage <laughs> where, um, you know, they're both kind of wide open. There's no, neither one's going to be a concept record. So mm -hmm. they're both wide open. So topically, I can switch it. Of course, any kind of occult stuff is going to go to the Dinner Sherman thing. Um, but when I just come up with a riff or, you know, vocal melody, um, it's t it, it, I'm, I'm just now coming into the conflict spot where, like, you know, where do I put this one? So I'm still kind of, you know, I'm still kind of, uh, learning as I go um, is to like when I come up with ideas like what's going to go where musically I think topically you know like I said I, I can figure that out but um, if I come up with a killer vocal melody I'm like Shh, do I use that on the cage record <laughs> yeah Tanner Sherman or so yes yeah, it's, it's uh, I'm still um, finding my way with that right now well that's so cool well Sean I'd like to thank you once again for taking time to talk to me I really enjoyed talking to you once again um 
Is there anything else you'd like to say to all the Sean Peck fans out there listening to this before we go? All the Sean Peck fans out there. The millions of Sean Peck fans. You, you might be surprised, my friend. Like you said, I mean, <laughs> Cage, Death Dealer, uh, Dinner Sherman. I mean, maybe one day we'll even get a Sean Peck solo record. Who knows? <laughs> oh, yeah. um, I just, you know, I would say this. If, you know, um, you know, I think that people that know me are really good know that, you know, I'm, all, I'm like a full-on, you know, Band guy. I, I wish I wish I was a stand up stand up comedian because I'm just always never serious, always trying to make people laugh. And the, next to performing, the second most fun thing is is just interacting with the, the fans and people that are into it. And you know, I every show, I mean, I just go out and hang out with the people. I, I don't sit backstage and I don't you know pretend that I'm some big freaking rock star or anything. Even though you know some people are very like, oh my god, it's Sean. <laughs> Uh, I just love hanging out with the metalheads because I'm a metalhead. I mean, I started, you know, I was a metal fan before I even thought about singing. The only reason I started singing because I thought guitar was way too much work. So <laughs> I, mean, I didn't know if I could sing. You know, I'm self-taught. I just started singing, and now here I am, you know, playing. If you would have told me when I... But when my buddy turned me on to King Diamond and Mercil Faye, if you would have told me, like, I'd be in a band with Hank Sherman and Michael Denner, that mm. would have been so freaking unbelievable yeah yeah then, look at you now <laughs> and then, you know, if you had told me that you know i'd be opening for iron maiden or open for judas priest or any of that it was, it's so mind-blowing that i've come from being this freaking you know metalhead fan kid to now you know putting together all this cool music and i write everything you know from the standpoint as a, as a metal fan and like i said i just love hanging out with people so, so you know if anyone ever thinks like i'm full of myself i'm not because it's just a big you know, I, I make jokes of, you know, of my, I joke about my ego, you know, like, saying nothing I like better than talking about myself. But yeah, I mean, yeah. Hanging out with the metalheads. I mean, I, I, hear, I, I hear it in your voice, I hear it in your attitude, um, you know, every time I talk to you, and that, that's the way to be, and like you said, you know, um, especially metal music, it, it really, um, it, it has a way of uniting people, I mean, I, um, you know, in interviewing and talking to uh, musicians like yourself, Sean, over years, I've had people tell me that, you know, uh, talking about a guy who was a legend, uh, Ronnie James Dio. Um, a lot of people told me he was one of the nicest guys. That um, I've heard stories where um, you know he he'd be um, at outside of a parking lot after a show at a stadium or whatever, an arena, and, and he'd be he'd be tired, but he'd wait and talk to every last fan. And t you know he wouldn't leave a fan. Um, he wouldn't go up and you know to his hotel room yeah. or whatever until he t got a chance to talk to every last fan. <laughs> and he's like, Cage! And like, we're like, what? And we look in there and he's like, come in here! And like, I don't know how he remembered who the fuck we were, but he just called us and he was sitting there, I think, you know, with like two other people and was like, hey guys, how you doing? And we're in Mexico, like, how the fuck does he remember who the fuck we are? Yeah, yeah, I heard stories, people tell me about Ronnie that um, he would meet people like that and then he'd see them down the line a couple years later and he'd always make a point like of getting somebody's name and once he met you, he remembered. He remembered who you were. Even had been like three or four years since he's seen you. Yeah, so you know, I try to keep that same attitude. But thanks for having me on, bro. It was a great interview, and uh, let's keep in touch. Uh, we'll definitely do it again. And uh, the interview itself will be going up um, in about uh, three or four weeks. I'll be sure to let the our mutual friend Valor to PR know. So um, we'll give him a huge shout out as well. Um, thanks again, Sean. You take care of yourself. Appreciate it. Talk to you later. Okay, bye bye.